Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to a uh, special live stream today. And this time, we're going to take a different angle than the typical angle that we take in our live streams. And obviously, the reason why we're doing this is because we have Joel Richardson with us. And when you have Joel, you have Joel's trumpet. And when you have Joel's trumpet, you have in time prophecy. And I really approached Joel and I said, listen, in light of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, could you just kindly come uh, to the show and let's do a live stream and shed some light on what does this mean from an end time prophecy in terms of updates? Now, by the way, I'm not saying uh, Joel is a prophet and knows exactly the future. Know that I'm saying that I'm telling you the future. We just take a shot at it from a scripture standpoint. And I'm sure there's a lot of exciting things here that we can learn from. And knowing Joel, you will be blessed just to listen to his take on things. And that's my expectation that today you too will also be blessed uh, uh, by listening to how he's going to take a, a look at this uh, conflict that is taking place. And maybe there is a lesson for us to learn from. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to continue to pray, of course, for the loss. And also we need to continue to pray for this conflict and for the Ukrainian and Russian people that uh, if they don't know the Lord, that this will be the opportunity for them to come to Christ. And if they are believers, that they will sense his presence and his protection. With that in mind, brother, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I appreciate you as always. You know how much I love your work. And thank you really for agreeing to do this in such, uh, such a short notice. My apology for putting you on the spot to do this, but I know where your heart is and I know the stuff that you're doing. So. Yeah, my pleasure. I always uh, enjoy getting to chat with you and be with you all, Fadi. So uh, the blessing is all mine. Thank you, my brother. So what can we learn, Joel, from what's uh, going on? You hear about Russia, Russia, Russia all the time in terms of end-time prophecy. I mean, does this tell us anything in light of maybe some of those things that we've heard about in the past from the scripture? So I'm going to summarize, even before I begin talking, I'm going to summarize three main points that I'm going to make, and um, then I can sort of unpack each of these three points. Um, first, let me say that before we even get into prophecy, um, there's obviously been a lot of um, talk. I mean, there's just been tremendous political controversy, particularly in the United States, you know, the past year or so, um, the end of the Trump presidency and the election and so forth. And you have a lot of Christians and not just Christians, but conservatives that have been affected by some of the ideas that were coming out of the QAnon world. And so interestingly, even the New York Times recently had an article um, essentially expressing that a lot of conservatives are almost siding with Putin. They're actually trying to justify the invasion, claiming that this is actually some sort of a um, secret collusion between President Trump and Putin, and it's all for good purposes. They'll emphasize a lot of the corruption in the Ukraine and different things like this. So in the church, then, of course, there's a lot of this discussion, I'll just say, in conservative conspiracy circles. And then in the church, there's a lot of people that are agreeing with that. And I want to just state outright that I think it's absolute, complete, utter nonsense, because it's actually being used to justify the invasion of Ukraine and actually saying it's a good thing. It's something that Christians um, who are opposed to the invasion, well, they're just going along with the mainstream narrative, what's popular and this type of thing. But those who have discernment realize this is a good thing and it's all part of Trump's plan or you know this type of thing. That is, it's complete asinine nonsense. It's irresponsible. It's justifying bloodshed in the name of some sort of elusive prophecy. So. That's one point that I want to make. The next point that I'll say, which is a little bit more mainstream in the church, is we're seeing numerous teachers, and of course, I mean, this is across the boards, people saying that Russia is Gog of Magog, or Gog and Magog, that Ezekiel 38 and 39, one of the most towering, important, critical Old Testament prophecies about the last days, is in the process of being fulfilled that when Ezekiel references Gog from Magog, in fact, there are numerous teachers that outright refer to Putin as Gog. Again, I want to say that's irresponsible hermeneutics. It is not what the Bible is teaching. Ezekiel is not talking about Russia. 
Gog Magog actually has nothing to do with Russia. In fact, it's, it's primarily talking about Turkey. Um, so that's another big point because everyone's saying this is the beginning of the Gog Magog battle. No, it's not. Biblically, I will challenge anyone to defend that position because it's unbiblical. It's, his, it's historically um, anachronistic in so many ways. I mean, there's just numerous problems with it. And then the third point that I want to say is this is the unfolding of exactly what I believe you and I talked about, Al-Fadi, which is in the aftermath of the American, the catastrophic, embarrassing nightmare of a withdrawal from Afghanistan. This is exactly what we expected to see, which is the rise of both Russia and China and the embarrassment, the further humiliation of the United States in general, or the United States specifically, but the West in general. So I believe that we're entering into a season. So now I'm just talking geopolitical, not, not necessarily prophecy, um, just geopolitical analysis. We're seeing the embarrassment, the humiliation, the diminishment of the United States and the West and the rise of Russia and China. And then as a result of their rise in power, um, we're seeing the empowerment of other rogue nations, such as North Korea, Iran, and we will continue to see them getting behind nations as they have in the past, such as Syria, and ultimately, I believe, long-term, the empowerment of the emerging um, prophesied revived caliphate, uh, caliphate throughout the Middle East. And so those are the three main points that I would summarize. Everything that I'm going to say is going to fall under one of those three categories. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that, Joel. And that's why I love about you, brother. Um, you do not hide uh, from from sharing truth uh, in love. I mean, again, uh, uh, truth has to be said. And I agree with you. I mean, to, to be honest, brother, sometimes I'm baffled by who are the national security advisors and the geopolitical advisors that the White House have. Seriously, seriously, brother, because the decisions that are made are absolutely embarrassing absolutely naive to say the least like just watch the nuclear deal with iran is going to be solidified just in a matter of days and see for yourself what's going to happen from the iranian side and pretty soon look what china is going to do and absolutely these decisions are the direct basically result of what's going on between russia and ukraine today because if i was uh, you know uh, the russian president i have ambition to add uh, to my territory this would be the perfect timing to do it, you know, because I already have seen uh, that the West and especially represented by the U.S. don't have the stomach to stand up against me. They don't have the backbone. Absolutely. You know, in with reference to the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion of this in the news, of course, because all attention is on Ukraine. But the discussions have been uh, taking place in Vienna um, and there's actually been a handful, not just one or two, but a handful of some of the key um, partners in the, the this sort of, I'm not sure exactly what the committee is called, that's part of this sort of discussion process, that have resigned over the past just week because the direction that it's going in terms of American negotiations under the Biden administration with Iran, that's unfolding right now in Vienna, Talks are underway, and there's been a handful of those on the American team that have resigned and said, this is absolutely catastrophic where this is going. This is ridiculous. The truth is not being reported. That's what they're saying, is, is what is actually happening here is not being reported. And so this has been a very slow train coming, so to speak. I mean, we've been talking about this going back into the Obama administration, saying, you know, any month now, any month now, Iran will have reached its ability to create nuclear weapons and this sort of thing and it, the can keep, continues to be kicked down the road and you know of course trump was the really the lull in the midst of it all um that removed obama's uh, deal but under biden in the past year they've sort of re-engaged and we're just this close as you said within a few days to iran essentially getting exactly what they wanted from the beginning this is the thing with these type of groups, with the Iranian regime. With It seems like Satan is much better at this, I hate to say it, but playing the long game. They're very patient. They have the goal in mind, 
and they aim for it. And it doesn't matter how long it takes to get there. They eventually will get there. And the United States seems to have a horrible, I mean, uh, the various administrations have a horrible memory. And for some reason, it's as though we are bound and determined to give the enemy exactly what they want every time, every time. And, and this is a big issue. Again, apart from Russia, apart from China, Iran is the greatest existential threat to a lot of our key allies throughout the region, whether we're talking Europe, of Saudi Arabia. I mean, they are terrified of, uh, of what will happen if Iran does get nuclear capabilities. Of course, Israel, as well as a lot of the other slightly more Western friendly nations of uh, Jordan and Egypt and the UAE, etc. And uh, the more sort of uh, radical or more radical leaning terrorist supporting nations like Qatar and Turkey. They don't mind at all if Iran gets nuclear weapons, but this is going to change the world. You know, what's happening with Russia is going to change the world. What's happening with Iran is going to change the world. And of course, what's emerging with China um, is absolutely going to change the world. And unfortunately, the future does not look very bright. Um, I, I tend to be a pessimist, but I think realism uh, has to take over at a certain point. Well said, my brother. Well said. And I'm in agreement on, uh, about everything you have just shared. And again, uh, we trust in the Lord. Obviously, if we put our hopes in men and in governments, we will never, ever um, uh, get our way. Uh, but the Lord is, is good and he has a plan. With that in mind, um, if you like to uh, take a, a prophecy look at this, uh, that will be uh, interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let me begin by saying that the idea that Russia is Gog of Magog. This is so widely taught throughout the body of Christ. Um, it's just, it's like on perpetual repeat. Uh, I, you know, I could probably just go on YouTube right now and find 10 different, very popular channels that are teaching. This is the beginning of the Gog Magog war. Let me just say this. I'm going to do a little sort of um, introduction to biblical hermeneutics, to prophecy and this sort of thing. So at the time that Ezekiel gave this oracle, this prophecy, um, we're looking at roughly the fifth century, you know, so just after the Babylonian exile and Ezekiel is in Babylon and he prophesies concerning this great coalition of nations in the last days specifically. It is a future prophecy. It was future to Ezekiel and it's future to us. It concerns the period that surrounds the return of Jesus. So it's an end time prophecy very clearly, but he lists a series of nations he refers to the leader of this, the dictator, if you will. He refers to him as Gog. He's an individual. He's actually a man. It says he will be buried in the valley of Haman Gog. So we know it's an individual. Yes, there is a, a spirit behind him, a principality behind him. But Gog is an individual, and Gog is probably a title. And he is from the land of Magog. Okay, so it's Gog from Magog, and he's the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, of Gomer and Beth Tagorma, as well as Persia, Cush, and Put. So you've got quite a list of nations. Now, this is not a comprehensive list. It says, and many nations with you. So it talks about this massive coalition of nations, mostly Middle Eastern and North African nations. So the question is, where is Gog from? Because Gog is from Magog. He's the chief prince. He's the chief over Meshech and Tubal. And so the question is, is this referring to Russia or is it referring, as I said, to Turkey? Now, there are two primary ways that we can interpret and understand these names. The first method of interpretation is what I call the historical bloodline DNA wild goose chase. So this is where you take, for example, the ancient, let's just say the Magogians, you know, the people from Magog. And you use all the historical resources that we have, all of the ancient historians, and you work through history and you try to determine where these people migrated, who they intermarried with, and today, who are the DNA ancestors of the ancient Magogians? Okay, and that this is the method that many interpreters use. And so if you do, if you read Josephus, who again was you know, roughly 500 years after Ezekiel, he says the Magogians became the Scythians. Now, of course, the problem is the Scythians were a massive, it's a very general term that doesn't refer to one narrow group of people. It's a, it's a very general term. It's almost like saying barbarians or um, Westerners. You know, it's a very broad term. 
But the Magogians did become the Scythians. They were very nomadic people. They migrated out of Asia Minor, Anatolia, that's modern-day Turkey, into modern-day Bulgaria, Romania, through Mo um, Belarus, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, into Russia. And then eventually they intermarried with the Rusians, the Rus peoples who came down from Scandinavia. But again, this is, you're talking in, during the medieval period, you're talking 1500 years after Ezekiel. And eventually these peoples became the Russians, okay? So there is some historical truth to the fact that the Magogians became the Russians. The problem is that if you want, if that's the method of interpretation that we want to use, you have to do it with every one of the names. You have to do it with Gomer. You have to do it with Beth Togorma. All of these different names. Now, if you do it, for example, with Gomer, well, the Gomerites became the Gimari. They became the Sumerians. They became peoples like the Gauls and the Celts. So now you're talking Germany. You're talking Ireland, Scotland, the UK, right? Like, so you'll see all these popular prophecy books and videos today talking about the coming Russian invasion of Israel. But there's no books out there about the coming Irish invasion of Israel, right? But if we are consistent with our method of interpretation, we would have to do just that. In fact, the peoples listed by Ezekiel are pri primarily the Japhetic peoples. They are the children of Japheth, the son of Noah, who these are essentially the Caucasians, the white peoples of the world. So we're talking the United States, South America, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., led by Russia. If we are consistent, what we would have is a Russian-led Western invasion of Israel, basically most of the Western world. Again, the coming Canadian invasion of Israel. Now, the other method of interpretation, the other method of understanding these names is very simple. How did Ezekiel and his immediate audience understand these names? Who were the peoples that he was referring to? Where did they live in his day? In Ezekiel's day, Gog was the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That's the region of Turkey. That's Anatolia. That's Asia Minor. Gomer and Beth Tagorma are basically eastern Turkey, expanding into the areas of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Put, uh, of course, is North Africa. Kush would be Sudan south of Egypt, and of course, Persia is Iran, modern-day Iran. So if we use the simple geographic correlation method, which is also called by, you know, if you go to seminary, it's just called the historical grammatical method. It's the responsible method. Ezekiel saw an invasion of nations against Israel led by Turkey. That was sort of the great north in Ezekiel's day, including Iran, including Libya, including Sudan. It's sort of the nations that surround Israel. That makes much more sense in terms of, in so many ways, if we just follow even to the grammar of the text. It's the only way that it really makes sense. Um, but unfortunately, and I'll say this, when you, and I've done a very careful study, El Fadi, working through the books, word by word from some of these big teachers, and my point is not to uh, attack them or berate them in any way, I won't say any of the names, but, you know, the big names, writing books about these things. I've worked through their, their working through these different names. And what they do, almost consistently, almost to a T, is they'll use the bloodline DNA historical wild goose chase method with regard to Magog to try to say this is led by Russia. But then they switch methods with most of the other names. They use the, histor the historical geographic correlation method, in other words, the historical grammatical method, and it's like a card trick. It's like a magic trick because they're switching techniques midstream to create the map of the nations that they want to create because they say from an American perspective, most of these teachers are American, they're going to point to these nations. They're going to say, yeah, this is Russia. This is Iran. They're going to point to all of the, the usual suspects, the bad guys, and they're going to say, these are the nations that are going to invade Israel. Um, but again, they're, it's a trick. They're using a card trick. They're switching methods. And what I'm saying is we need to be consistent. We need to be responsible. And in which case, we're looking at a Turkish-led Middle Eastern North African invasion of Israel. And it has nothing to do with Russia whatsoever. So then as we turn to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
people will say, well, so are you trying to say that this has no relevance at all? And I go, no, absolutely. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is this is not Gog Magog. This is not that. There are many other very important realities with regard to what's happening. But let's not confuse which passage to look at, so to speak, as we're talking about what Russia is doing. So that would be sort of my summary overview of this whole issue of uh, Gog Magog. Thank you, brother. Uh, that was very helpful. And uh, and I would agree with you, of course. And, and the idea coming from the north, uh, just, just to give people an uh, you know, uh, uh, just a background behind this. From Ezekiel's perspective, the North meant even if nations are on the east uh, uh, of Israel, they still have to go through the Fertile Crescent, go north and come down from north. So he wasn't kind of like uh, prophesying something wrong. Uh, and it's a coalition of nations. And it, you could argue that uh, maybe the lead nation is intended here from north or the whole nations uh, a group of nations and coalition will gather north and come down. Either way, uh, I don't see any issue with that because I heard this these kind of things before as well. Yeah, you'll actually see it in the prophecy of Joel where he talks about Babylon coming and invading Israel from the north. Well, of course, Babylon's to the east, but as you said, they come in from the north. They always come in through the Golan. And the ultimate final invasion of the Antichrist, which is Gog, by the way. Gog is simply the Antichrist. Ezekiel is telling the same story that all the other prophets are telling. What Ezekiel is talking about is the same thing that Zechariah 12 through 14 is talking about, the same thing that Joel chapter 3 is talking about, etc., etc. And um, and they ultimately do come in through the north. Yeah. So um, just you know, in, in a general way, uh, what do you see this conflict um, uh, going to lead into? Um, whether, you know, we, we talked about the geopolitical, of course, we can continue to add to that. Or maybe from a prophecy standpoint, is it paving the way for something? Yeah. And so let me say this. I'm just going to, you know, I always want to be very clear. I'm not expounding scripture right now. What I'm doing is just geopolitical speculation. Um, with the catastrophic American withdrawal from Afghanistan, and it's and and more than that, just I mean the world looks on. Al Fadi, my father died two years ago, and he had advanced dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, I know the look in his eye. Um, we're not being overly political partisan, you know, Republican conservatives when we say President Biden has early stage dementia. Anyone can anyone that's had that's cared for dementia patients, et cetera, they see the look in his eye. They, You can watch the videos. It's very clear. I mean, just the other day when he was given the State of the Union speech, he talked about Ukraine and he referred to the Iranian people. You can say, well, that was just a slip. He's reading from a teleprompter. He makes a lot of these slips, far more than the average president. Uh, and so the world's looking on. They're looking at an American president who's basically senile. He's slipping into dementia. And he's weak. I mean, politically, he's weak. And then they looked at Afghanistan. It was catastrophic. All American allies are saying, we can't trust America. We can't rely on the United States anymore. And unfortunately, the Ukraine is learning just that. They can't rely on us. Look, right now, we're still, to this day, saying that we're opposed to the Ukrainian, the invasion of Ukraine. And still, 10% of all of our oil ex, uh, imports are coming from Russia. No kidding. We're no buying. Kidding. I mean, we're basically, yeah. the United States is tithing. We're tithing yes. to Russia. Thank you for yeah. saying this. Yeah. We are responsible for the death of every soul in Ukraine right now because we're paying blood money for it to happen. And you know what I discovered today? About 680,000 barrels of oil are being imported from Russia. That's the number that I heard. If we were to reopen the, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the pipeline now in, in North Dakota, uh, it, it, that particular pipeline, if we were to roll open it again, we can actually generate about 750,000, some will say even 800,000 barrels a day. Not only it will help with uh, lowering the price of oil, of course, and gas and everything else, but we can say, you know what, we're not sponsoring this guy and feeding him money to go and butcher people. Exactly. You know, the proverb uh, says, he who sets a trap for another, he himself will fall into that very trap. And, you know, so here we are, the United States claiming that we're putting sanctions on Putin. 
And yet, as you said, we're buying 10% of all of our oil from Russia because we refuse to, as you said, open up the uh, the pipeline there. Yeah, the name of it slips my, my mind right now as well. Uh, Keystone, we give, Keystone pipeline. Keystone. We could yeah. give tens of thousands of jobs to Americans. We could wean ourselves from Russian oil. We could, like, why, what, how does it make sense to ha have sanctions and then continue to buy oil from them? It doesn't. We could, here's the reality is, and, and, I, and I say this cautiously, it is not unthinkable that the day will come when we will see Russian troops on American soil. You know, we're literally empowering an individual who is not thinking, I mean, he's the exact opposite of the weak, spineless European bureaucrat. He's just the opposite. And he wants to, I mean, basically what he's doing, he's made it very clear, he stated it, is he wants to sort of undo the the entire sort of um, global structure. He wants to return to where the West is diminished and Russia and China and so forth are, are on the upswing. And even just culturally, it's so important. You know, in, in the American education system, the Western education system for decades now, we have been brainwashed to believe that we should be ashamed of ourselves. Now, to be clear, the United States has a history of a lot of failures and falling short of what our ultimate ideals are. But the bottom line is this, the principles of equality, of freedom, of liberty, these type of things that are that are embedded in the very foundations of the our constitution and, and founding documents, they are superior. They are better than, for example, Islamic law, you know, which says the testimony of a woman is only half as valid as a man, this type of thing. Or, for example, the values that are part and parcel of the foundation of uh, of, of China's communist sort of, um, you know, philosophy. We have superior principles and those are worth fighting for. But we feel ashamed of who we are and we are rolling. We're, we're laying down. We're rolling out the red carpet and they view themselves as on the ascendancy. China views itself as rising as ambitious. So they have everything culturally, in terms of their education, just emotionally, they believe it's almost their divine destiny to, to become the, the leaders of the world. And we don't have, we don't have any sense of cultural confidence. We don't believe there's anything even worth fighting for. We've got a high percentage now of millennials, like 30% that think communism is good. So there's, you know, we've been brainwashed, we've been hamstrung by the by the liberal education system. And when you have a weak culture and a very confident culture clashing, one is going to just run right over the other. And so it's not unrealistic to think that in our lifetimes, we actually could see Russian troops, which we are funding right now on American soil. We could fall into the very trap that we ourselves are preparing. Absolutely. And you know what? You're not saying anything unusual here because today also I heard in one of the reports, I, I, you know, I have another side of me that I don't share with people. In fact, I may even launch a channel, just talk political and geopolitical things. I, I follow these reports all the time. They are surprised, meaning uh, uh, Europe in general, NATO in particular, the U.S. also surprised by how quickly uh, uh, the Russian troops actually reach certain destinies within Ukraine, come to discover that they were embedded there for a while. They were just waiting for the green light. And to answer your question, who knows? Uh, we have a southern border that is open. Why wouldn't Russia send people? I don't understand it. I mean, why wouldn't anybody send people through the southern border? Hey, it's open and we're saying, come on over. And we want to, by the way, defend the borders of Ukraine. You know, what an amazing amazing philosophy defending the borders of ukraine but forgetting about our own border brother that's why i said i have no idea who gives counsels to our president because they're not doing him good service and for these green uh, basically uh, activists or environmentalists to watch ukrainians die and we still don't want to turn the spigot back on at the keystone pipeline because we believe in worshiping the environment Man, this this is a war crime right there. To be honest with you, yeah, it really is, and it's it's bizarre because it, it the, the the hyper partisan political atmosphere in the United States is such that if you're just a voice of reason, like like if someone speaks up and they're basically like let's say a 1970s or 80s liberal today, they sound like a conservative, 
and the mainstream media is going to say this alt right extreme right wing trumper you know like you can't you can't be anything like if you're just slightly down the spectrum if we're just reasonable talking about saving lives they're going to frame uh, frame you or me as radical right wingers as alt right extremists and this type of thing and and really what we're saying would would fall in line with a JFK you know John Kennedy or you know presidents that were considered democrats that were considered liberal back when i was a kid um and today that's considered radical right wing because the 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 whole uh, again the whole political system has moved so radically to the left that um you know and i really do i believe ultimately it's the lord's judgment on the nation um the, when when a nation is being judged the lord gives them weak confused leaders um I'll even go to the point of saying insanity, you know, to where where Ukraine is far less important than celebrating transgender diversity within the administration or this type of thing, right? Like like diversity, not just ethnic racial diversity, but you know, sexual diversity and things that are nonsensical anyway, you know, like a man that tries to pretend and dress up like he's a woman and celebrating and honoring and validating that satanic insanity that's far more important than saving tens of thousands yay hundreds of thousands saving a nation and this is the type of bizarro world this is the, the yeah. type of i mean we've entered dr strange's alternative universe and these are the folks that are running the government yeah let's uh, I, I want us to address uh, I, I love this conversation brother i think you and i have discovered a new angle uh, uh for, for our future shows but but i want to put this comment right here i'm going to show you the level of naivety okay so when we just talked right now about the border look the uh, uh the comment that we're getting uh you are sick anti-immigrant fatty uh you know what he's saying he's saying that the lord when he told nehemiah to build a wall around jerusalem the lord was also sick anti-immigrant because he wanted a wall uh, around uh, basically Jerusalem. What do you say to, to people who are so uh, actually naive to the point that they don't even think through national security, they don't think through policies, they don't think, so all, this is what he just said right now, all nations in the world are anti-immigrant and just the US is not. You know, the boilerplate liberal response, the mindless, as you said, naive, thoughtless, liberal response to reason is to say you are a racist, bigot, homophobe, anti-immigrant. And you go, wait a minute, I'm not white. I am an immigrant. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm all for immigration, legal immigration. But this is just the thing. You are, you know, a bigot, homophobe, this and that. They just throw out these names. And li listen, to be honest, what's more tiring at this point? What is more tiring to say you're a racist or you're a fascist? Like at, at a certain point you go, really? Like I'm a fascist because you know what? Like I'm trying to feed my family and this, like these things are so overused. It's so tiring. It's so banal. Like it's so unoriginal. There's just no thought put into it. The idea that anyone can walk across our southern borders illegally, unabated, and somehow if you're opposed to that, you're anti-immigrant. That's, I'm sorry, Capricorn, whoever's speaking, it's stupid. Like, use your head. You don't open your door and let any homeless person come and live in your children's bedroom or someone who breaks in any time. And if you say, I don't want you to break into my house illegally because I don't know you and I haven't vetted you properly. You could be a human smuggler for all I know. You could be smuggling fentanyl, which is killing more American children than anything right now. You say, I don't believe in all of this. Well, you're anti, uh, you're against the homeless. No, like it's nonsense. It's stupid. So please, Kevin, like hear our hearts. I, like literally, who am I right now? Like who, 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 who's talking right now? We have Al Fadi, who's an immigrant from Saudi Arabia. Most of my time right now is working with refugees from Afghanistan and from the Middle East. Like most of my day is spent helping legal immigrants from Afghanistan get to either Canada or the United States. This is what I do for a living. And, and to say you're anti-immigrant is just, it's, it's dumb. Like it's just flat out stupid.
brother, they're just like parrots. They repeat whatever they're told. If you ask him, he doesn't even know probably what he's talking about or what she's talking about. Again, I just wanted to show it because it was really hilarious uh, to watch this. Uh, you can, like you said, you cannot make a, a sound argument anymore because the minute you make it, and, and like I said, literally, find me a single country in the world that does not do any form of protecting its border. Now, even if you were able to slip in, they still have guards. They still like to protect their border. And if they discover you, you'll be lucky if they deport you. I mean, you try to break into the borders of Saudi, you'll be lucky if they deport you immediately. Right. Go and do it and see for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you and I right now, like, let's say we snuck into Saudi Arabia, let's say we snuck into Jordan and we got caught. The very same people that are saying you're anti-immigrant would say you're, you know, they would have some other name, you know, like you're an arrogant American. You think you can go anywhere, you know, like that type of thing. Like how, who, who gives you the right to go to Jordan? Who gives you the right to sneak into Saudi Arabia? Like they would attack us for that. Whereas if someone does it into our country, look, Look, again, I, you know, and my family, I'm a, I have a transracial family. We have three different ethnicities in my family. Like, like in terms of the things that I focus on and read, I would say, you know, among conservatives, I probably have some very, what would be considered very centrist um, views on race and justice and a lot of these things. But if you simply are not for open borders, this is the insanity, the brainwashing that we've got to then somehow you are a racist, bigot, homophobe, anti-immigrant, this type of thing. It's, it's yeah, it's it's almost not even worth addressing, as I said. It's just so tiring and unoriginal. Anyway, brother, I mean, it's unfortunate, obviously, and uh, this person doesn't really know the consequence of these kind of policies. And uh, again, um, uh, we I believe uh, God is in control, of course. God is not scratching his head about what's going on, whether at our southern border or in Europe or between Russia and Ukraine. But uh, but God also gave us a brain to reason with. He says, come, let us reason. He's expecting us to reason and to think through the arguments. Uh, anything else, brother, you want to add to, to this uh, or even uh, other things you would like to mention concerning uh, what's unfolding right now, and and let's say Russia succeeds in taking part of Ukraine. Uh, some some believe it's only part of Ukraine. They just want Kyiv and and somehow topple the government. I believe uh, it's all out right now. I I talk to people in Romania, by the way, and in uh, Poland, and they are very nervous about what's happening right now. Yeah, I've been having some conversations with uh, one of my friends from Bulgaria who is very knowledgeable, and. Um, and, and yeah, they're very upset and and upset to to the degree that Americans don't seem to understand what's happening. But look, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know, you know, how much Ukraine will hold out and this type of thing. But there's the very strong possibility that we that a, a switch could have just been flipped, so to speak, with the Biden administration. Um, that I, I and I do believe this with the fall of Afghanistan, it is heralding a new era, and we very well could see. Um, a world that's no longer, you know, unipolar. It's no longer one dominant uh, economic and military superpower, that being the United States. We could now be entering into the age where China and Russia um, are the dominant powers, really China and, and Russia probably secondarily dominant powers throughout the world and where America continues to be humiliated, diminished. I mean, if if Western allies, if American allies didn't lose faith in America with Afghanistan, certainly they're losing faith with the Ukraine. Um, and there is kind of a racial element there to where, um, you know, in the United States, people could justify, well, we don't need to be involved over there in, in um, Afghanistan, but the Ukrainians are Caucasian, thus the majority ethnicity in the United States. And so there's a degree to which, well, they look more like the, the majority um, ethnic group, you know, the, the dominant ethnic group in the United States. And so, as you said, what's next? Moldova, well, Belarus and Romania, you know, Eastern Europe, I guess they, that would be up for um, that would be up for a uh, conflict between Turkey and Russia would really be fighting for the heart of Eastern Europe, um, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, the former Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. And and so forth. But then, you know, you're looking. Yeah, as you said, Poland and and, you know, now the communists are at the gates of Europe. But it could be it could be much more than that. We could 
we could see full uh, legitimate World War III. Like that's not impossible. This is the most, this is the first time since 1945 that we've seen a modern superpower like Russia invading another technologically advanced um, nation like this unapologetically. I mean, just a full blown ground invasion. It's, yeah. it's, we've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes. And watching the footages, by the way, you know, it takes me back to World War One and World War Two. I'm, I'm like, am I watching a movie? Uh, because th that's exactly how it looks like. You know, uh, uh, basically, you watch these uh, uh, com uh, convoys of, of uh, military, uh, basically vehicles and uh, and uh, uh, tanks and and all things that are taking place right now in this convoy that they keep saying it's like forty miles long. And I'm looking at it, brother. I'm saying. You have a convoy that you know how long it is. It's right there. It's stuck. And no one is doing anything about it. No one is doing it. I mean, this is like a sitting duck right now. I mean, that's that's what it is. It seems uh, everybody washed their hands. We're watching, you know, news every day as if the news uh, people are salivating just to report to you how many people died and the atrocities and what's what bombed and what else can we do? I mean, we can't be just watching people being butchered just because somebody didn't like them. Or didn't like their their government and it's unfortunate brother i mean you mentioned that afghanistan you know basically uh made people not trust us and now ukraine i mean let's think about the iranian deal and and what happened in the middle east because of that let's think about the kurdish people that we turn our back on them and uh, what what that means i mean we seem like to uh been doing a great job in stabbing people in the back i mean we, we we're not really running out of uh choices to do so and we're expecting people somehow to still consider us to be a superpower. Right. Yeah. And in fairness, let me just say this, too. The betrayal of the Kurds happened under Trump administration. And this was one of my greatest frustrations with President Trump is he didn't seem to have any real understanding um, of the situation with the Kurds. There was times that he made reference to cities in Iraq and referred to them as though they were in Syria, you know, and I, you know, I'm listening to him going, he has no idea what he's talking about here, but we did. We stabbed in the back and betrayed the Kurds who are one of our greatest allies in the region, um, who were one of the few peoples that were really standing up and fighting against ISIS. We gave them very little help. You know, we sort of rooted them on. And then when the time came, we stabbed them in the back. And so that's just sort of another example of uh, of americans losing trust losing the trust of the world and of course the big one and this is nothing new it's been discussed quite a bit in the news is well now china's going to look and say hey if we're going to go for taiwan now's the time to do it absolutely and Maybe it's not, not at all unreasonable that we could see that even before the year is over we could see china beginning to move on taiwan and then what's next after that yeah you know brother i say this with a broken heart china if they just decide today to partner with russia we don't stand a chance period i mean they will do it sitting behind their computers actually just a cyber warfare that's all they will do before they even send a single soldier on our ground i don't think we are ready for this kind of war and i can understand why we're not doing anything because we recognize our weakness right now again i'm not promoting for war by the way i'm not saying we want people to go and die but what I'm saying, what is being done is absolutely embarrassing, absolutely embarrassing right now. Yeah, look, I'm not for war either. But even as it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war and there's a time to stand up against bullies. Um, exactly. You, you know, I, I'll tell a funny story. Well, I maybe I shouldn't tell it. Um, I actually got assaulted. I was in the Atlanta airport uh, a few weeks ago and I actually some guy punched me in the face um because he was screaming at this gate agent and calling him the gate agent was black and he was screaming at him calling him a racist had nothing to do with race it was way way over the top and everyone's just standing there watching you know and we're, it's almost like everyone's used to someone flipping out karen's doing this and that but it was a couple but this was way beyond just sort of flipping out like they were calling this guy names that were just unacceptable and i was just standing right there and I just said to the guy, I said, look, you don't talk to people that way. You don't talk to another person that way. And he got my face and this, that, and the other thing. And the guy ended up punching me in the face. Well, he got arrested and I had, you know, broke my lip open and messed me up and this sort of thing. I don't regret it one bit. Like, I don't believe in violence. I don't pursue violence. I don't look for it. But there is a time for violence. Like, if you're walking through the park and you see a woman being assaulted, you use violence to save that woman. When someone is being bullied, 
you stand up for those that are oppressed, those that are downtrodden. I believe that's biblical. This is a big debate, obviously, among Christians. No, no, no brother, I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I'm, I'm not against it. I mean, I, I was just saying uh, we're not for war, but there is a time. I mean, what's happening right now is one of those times that we have to do something for the sake of people. So uh, I'm going to show you another uh, naive comment. You know, how dare you and I make a comment about the Kurdish people? Because now we are anti-Trumpers, by the way, and therefore we are snowflakes. You see how, how naive these people are? I mean, it's so funny. You can't say anything. You cannot right. even express your opinion. So it's yeah. okay for the Kurdish people to get stabbed in the back and somehow they get butchered by Turkey. And I can't say anything about that. I mean, dare I say? I mean, how do you know that we don't like Trump, by the way? What gave you the right to even judge my heart? How do you know? By the way, yeah, Trump I, is my, not my savior. I have to tell you that much. You know, I don't worship the guy. Just because I like the guy, I don't worship the guy. Okay? I voted for Trump both times. Um, proud proud to say I voted for him, of course, you know, versus Hillary and, uh, and Biden. Voted for him both times. And what I said specifically is I said the one time that, that Trump really, really upset me is how he treated the Kurds. And so this clown said, says, you guys are snowflakes. Again, try to use your head. Try to be a little bit more creative. Try to be a little more original, and try to use insults that are that are um, that are a little less tired. Um, but yeah, you're going to get it from both sides, unfortunately. So we saw the the mindless liberal, and now we've seen the mindless um, fellow that worships Trump, and Trump cannot do anything wrong. And uh, and again, that's that's silly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm like you. I was so baffled by that decision when it happened. I felt so bad for the Kurdish people. And I'm like, we're watching them getting butchered right now. I mean, again, brother, it, it's just uh, God is good. That's all I can say. Let me say this about the Kurds. Um, unlike the fellow that commented, I actually visit with the Kurdish people, go to northern Iraq. Um, you had 100,000 Kurdish soldiers that were fighting to liberate Mosul, which of course is ancient Nineveh, and this is where ISIS had taken over. You had about 100,000. These are all civilian soldiers. They rotate in for a week or two at a time. They leave their job, and they go and fight for the military, and then they go back to their families. 100,000 Kurds on the north fighting ISIS. Like, this is pretty clear in terms of who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And the Kurds are very, very moderate Muslims as far as Muslims go. And they're hated by everyone. They're hated by the Arabs. They're hated by the Turks. They're hated by the Persians. They get mistreated by everyone. They don't have their own nation. But nevertheless, without any real support, they're fighting ISIS. They had one ambulance. 100,000 soldiers on the northern front to liberate Mosul. They had one ambulance. We started working. We raised money. We bought through a ministry that I'm, I partner with, Frontier Alliance International, bought them three ambulances, started sending medics, started you know, blessing them and helping them just, again, people getting shot in the arm and bleeding out, having to drive two hours to Erbil to go to the hospital, this type of thing, like insanity. And they did that. They liberated Mosul and they did it without a lot of help. You know, we sent in probably some special forces to do some training, but there was not much. And then Trump basically gave Kirkuk, which is the heart of Iraqi Kurdistan. He basically gave it over to the Iranian-backed Shia militia. So there was clearly a deal cut, um, and basically we allowed, as you said, the Kurds to be slaughtered by the Iranians. And this is just an example, whereas a real man stands up for his friends when his friends are in need. This isn't about, oh, you need to say good things about Trump every single time. The vast majority of policies that Trump engaged in, I supported, I loved, I stand with. But on that decision, it was wrong. It was Same wrong. Here. We Same should be here, able to say that. I mean I mean, do I want the guy to come back? Of course I do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's not my call. It's God's call. I mean, if he wants him back, it's going to happen. Uh, okay. But at the same time, uh, okay, we're going to have someone like Trump or Trump himself. And then what? It seemed like we are going through up and down in this country from a political standpoint. I mean, okay, they wait for four years or eight years, then they come back and unwind everything that was done and, and that's not healthy for our nation and i think uh, nations like turkey uh, like uh, uh, china and russia they're starting to learn that that's how it goes you know okay i'll wait i mean why didn't he make this move putin uh, uh, during trump administration because he knew trump can meet him face to face and he can bully him just like he's bullying ukraine
So he didn't do it. He waited for the right moment. Yeah. Right now, the United States, as you said, it's up, down, up, down, but kind of like cryptocurrency or Bitcoin right now, it's trending down. It's a it's a bear market, whereas China and Russia, yeah, they're similar up, down, up, down, but they're trending up. And eventually that those those concurrent lines, you know, they they once once they cross, the difference is going to be pretty dramatic. And I, I don't see it going the other direction. Amen. Well, brother, um, anything else you want to add to this before we wrap this up? No, look, you know, we've talked a lot about just geopolitical analysis, politics and this type of thing. When all is said and done, the ultimate thing that matters is not the United States, the Ukraine, Russia, this type of thing. The thing that matters is the gospel. The thing that matters is souls being saved. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, we can all have different opinions about what this means or what it might mean. We need to be praying for the Ukrainians. We need to be praying for the young the, the young Ukrainian evangelical church, obviously, or the Eastern Orthodoxy is dominant there. Um, and we need to be praying, as you said, for Russians, the, the relatively younger Russian evangelical church. They're a minority. They're persecuted. Um, it is, again, a Russian Eastern Orthodox majority. Often the Christians, the institutional Christians are persecuting the evangelicals. And, um, and here in the West, we need to pray for the church to wake up as well. Amen, my brother. And I want to second that. And we want the church really to uh, open its eyes and and begin to pray for the return of the real king. That's right. what we want. And, uh, and and again, what I love about our Bible, the word of God, it's very clear. I told us about tribulation and trouble times and wars and rumors of war. So we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't act like we're surprised or even uh, baffled by actions like what's going on right now. Sinners, uh, wicked people do exist. We're all sinners, by the way. The only difference is some of us are saved and others are not. So we should not really be the least surprised by the actions that we will be seeing from Putin or others like him. And this won't be the end of it. Uh, I mean, even if you end it, look, we ended Hitler. There we go. Uh, seven years later, we're watching almost similar atrocities right now. And uh, uh, things like this they never end because there are principalities, there are uh, demonic powers out there that are behind all of this. Their agenda is to destroy the peace that is on earth and only Christ can offer that. Right. Well, brother, thank you so much. And I really, really would love to do more of this with you. I love the passion. I like the geopolitical discussions. And I like to have some trolls also that we can enjoy uh, responding to. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, everyone, for uh, everything. Uh, By the way, are you doing any uh, writings, debates, anything you want to mention to people right now so they can track uh, with you? Nothing major right now. You know, we've been teaching through the Book of Revelation together. That's on my YouTube channel, also on Frontier Alliance International. Um, we, they, we have an app, you can go to your app store and download it. And we've been working through the book of revelation. We're at like session 43 right now. We're in chapter, uh, 14. We've still got, you know, probably several more months to go. Um, but other than that, nothing major to, to announce. Have you done anything from the book of Ezekiel or book of Daniel also for people to go and read or listen to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So and let me say this. All of my books are available for free as PDF files on my website, which is joelstrumpet.com. And so, for example, if you want to read some of the things that I've written with regard to Daniel and Ezekiel, in particular, the book Mideast Beast is probably a great place to start. And as I said, that's free on my website. Of course, if you need a hard um, copy or Kindle or that sort of thing, then it's you can you can get it through my website um, or you can go on Amazon as well. I'm asking because I'm preaching through Ezekiel and I have yet to scratch the service. So uh, oh, I yeah. thought about you and I'm like, uh, where do you go? Uh, you, you know, you know where to go. Joel Richardson. <laughs> well, if, if you're a commentary guy, let me just say this. Um, Daniel Block in the NICOT series, New International uh, Commentary in the Old Testament. Um, it's a two volume. Uh, that's hands down. Probably you're, he's a little bit slightly more liberal, you know, but nevertheless, he's a real scholar. And that's a great uh, commentary if you need a little help here and there. And sure. So I think I have the collection on uh, Lagos, but if I don't, uh, I'll tap you on the shoulder to see how I can uh, get a hold of that. But I'll, I want to look at your books because we're still in the early phase. I, I just finished The Calling of Ezekiel, which is the first three chapters. So we're, we're ways away from, from getting to uh, 
Ezekiel 38 and 39. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, brother. Thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this. Folks, by the way, this show uh, wasn't to talk about a president or a government. This show is to talk about what's going on in the world that we have to be more reasonable to assess what's happening from a biblical perspective, from, from a God-given perspective. We are not here to try to lobby for this name or that name, even though we've been attacked and insulted for saying things that are reasonable, okay? Uh, we have to call what is right, right, and what is wrong, wrong, from a logical standpoint, okay? Don't let passion, folks, get in a way where you cannot reason anymore. That's not good, that's dangerous. When you become passionate about one person or one name or one party, this is what happened. Uh, an entire nation can be destroyed over things like this. Israel went through all of that because of the infiltration of liberal thoughts and disobedience to God's laws, and the punishment was so severe. And we don't want to go through this. Uh, at least we don't want to go through it willingly. But at the end of the day, we know the end. We are victorious in Christ. Jesus is coming back. He will rule the world and uh, we just have to wait for that between now and then he says this gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations then the end will come so we know our mission we are his ambassadors regardless of what's happening in the world or on the world stage we still have a responsibility to share the good news with the lost amen amen Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you and hope to see you in a few days. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless. Take care.